All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How many people were here this morning or were somewhere else at the time? All right, how many of you are here now? How many don't respond to surveys? Four out of 10 don't respond to surveys, Pastor. All right, how many people were not here this morning for any of it? Didn't see any of it? Where were you? You blew it. I can't go through the whole thing again, so let me just do a three-minute overview of what we did. We started out this morning by talking about Petty Officer Michael Monsor, United States Navy SEAL, who literally sacrificed himself by falling on a grenade to save his two teammates lying next to him in Ramadi, Iraq. This was in 2006. And we asked the question, Michael Monsor sacrificed himself to save his friends. Would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And we said, somebody already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But a lot of people don't think this story's true. They think it's invented. It's got miracles in it. We don't believe in miracles anymore. So how can we believe that Christianity's true? And we said, we needed to look at four questions. And here are the four questions. Does truth exist? Does God exist? Are miracles possible? And is the New Testament true, particularly with regard to the resurrection? Because if truth exists, God exists, miracles are possible, and Jesus rose from the dead, then Christianity's true. Of course, if any of those questions are answered no, then Christianity can't be true. So this morning, we went through this question, does truth exist? Because a lot of people say, that there is no truth, you got your truth, I got my truth. We covered all this this morning, so let's just review it quickly. And remember, whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson, right? <laughs> now don't blow this line like you did this morning. Because Tom Cruise, just, just to reorient you, here is how it actually went. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! All right, let's do it properly. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! All right, good. That's good. The atheists have no chance now, now that you're fired up, all right? And we said that there's a thinking skill that you can use to discover what is false, because so many of the statements you hear in our culture are literally false. They're self-defeating. They violate the law of non-contradiction, and the first one we talked about was this. If someone says there is no truth, you're going to ask what question? Is that true? Yes, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. Remember, we covered this. And this is known as a self-defeating statement. And the way you identify self-defeating statements is you turn the claim on itself. So this morning, we did this. We talked about when somebody says there are no absolutes, you're going to say what? Is that an absolute? When somebody says you ought not judge, you're going to say, is that a judgment? Why are you judging me for judging? If somebody says it's true for you but not for me, you're going to say, is that true for everybody? I mean, all of these statements that people make that are trying to put forth relativism actually are self-defeating. They're false. And so we pointed out that's what you need to do. You need to turn the claim on itself. And we summarized it this way. Can everyone see that this statement shoots itself? Right? <laughs> we did that this morning. And we said, therefore, that if truth exists, that relativism and postmodernism are false. Why? Because relativism and postmodernism say there is no such thing as truth when in fact that's a truth claim itself. We also pointed out that frequently, when we go to college campuses, often I'll ask atheists, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And they often say, no. Why? Because unbelief, more often than not, is not a problem of evidence, it's a problem of emotion, it's a problem of the will. It's not a head problem, it's a heart problem. People are looking for God like a criminal's looking for a cop. They're not interested. So always ask the question, if you're talking to somebody who's not a Christian, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If they hesitate or say no, the problem is not in the head, the problem's in the heart. And what do you do for somebody like that? You pray, you love them, which doesn't mean you necessarily approve of everything they do. You plant seeds and then you wait. So we covered this this morning. 
And we said truth does exist. Now we're going to see if God exists. Okay, that's all review. You guys ready for new material? All right. I mentioned this morning that there are three arguments we're going to look at for the existence of God. These arguments are taught in the Bible, but you don't need the Bible to know them. And uh, there are more than three, but these are just the three we're going to look at tonight. The first argument is the argument from the beginning of the universe known as the cosmological argument. Now, cosmological comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. And it says if the universe had a beginning, then there must be a beginner. And that argument has some scientific evidence behind it. The second argument is the argument from design, known as the teleological argument. Telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose. And it says if there's design in the universe and design in life, you, then there must be a designer. That argument has scientific evidence behind it. We'll see some of that here in a few minutes. The third argument doesn't have any science behind it. It's more philosophical in nature, yet it's the argument you've all understood since you were very small children. It's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says if there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one, like it's wrong to torture babies for fun, or it's wrong to murder six million people in a holocaust, or it's wrong to shoot people at a club, which happened last night, not far from here, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no standard beyond humanity, then everything's just a matter of opinion. That's just your opinion against a baby torturer's opinion, or your opinion against Hitler's opinion, or your opinion against some shooter's opinion. Well, we know those issues aren't just a matter of opinion. It's not just my opinion that torturing babies for fun is wrong. That's really wrong. If that's really wrong, there must be a standard of really right outside of ourselves that we are obligated to obey. That is what we mean by God's nature. If God doesn't exist, nothing's ultimately right or wrong, yet we all know things are right and wrong. Now, we'll get to that argument later, but we've got to start at the, at the argument from the beginning of the universe. Now, you got to admit, it was worth coming out here on a Sunday night just to see God do that. I mean, some of you have said, I've never seen God move. Oh, really? Check this out. Look at that right there. Now, this is the argument that many say points back to the big... Now, I know some of you are going, uh, Frank, you know, we are Christians in here, and uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. In fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good that even the top atheistic scientists in the world are admitting it. Stephen Hawking, who was probably the top physicist in the world until he died about five years ago, put it this way. He said, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, Hawking tried to come up with another explanation other than God for the beginning. He failed, but he's admitting the evidence. He's admitting that space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing. And it wasn't just Hawking who said this. Even great agnostic cosmologists like Alexander Vilenkin from Russia put it this way. He said, with the proof now in place, cosmologist, by the way, a cosmologist is not someone that puts on your makeup, all right? <laughs> A cosmologist is someone that studies the universe. Cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, two interesting words in this quote. First interesting word is the word proof. Very unusual for scientists to use the word proof. Why? Because science, by definition, is tentative. New theories come along all the time that usurp older theories. It's usually not something scientists do to call their theory a proof, but Vilenkin sees so many lines of evidence pointing at one conclusion, that space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing, that he's saying it constitutes a proof. The other is the word problem. Why is it a problem? Because if space, time, and matter had a beginning, if nature had a beginning, what could have caused nature to have a beginning. It can't be more nature. There was no nature. It can't be a natural cause. It must be a cause that transcends nature, what we would call a supernatural cause. Now, he's an agnostic. He doesn't know if this points to God, but it seems to me it does. 
Now, we're not even going to look at the evidence for this. Why? Number one, we don't have time. Number two, it's all in the book, chapter three. And number three, it's not controversial. Even the atheists are admitting it. What is controversial is what could have caused the universe to come into existence out of nothing. Not that it did. Everyone's agreeing on that. Most people are anyway. So let's take a look. Let's just jump to the bottom line. If the universe had a beginning, then it must have had a beginner. We've got two options. Either no one created something out of nothing, that's the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, that's the theistic view. Now here's my only question. Which view is more reasonable? That no one created something out of nothing or that someone created something out of nothing? What do you think? Someone, right? I was at Texas A&M. This had to be 15 years ago. I put this slide up and some atheist in the audience said, oh, I think number one is more reasonable. I said, time out. Let's look at number two for a second. Number two says, someone created something out of nothing. Now that's a miracle, but at least you got a miracle worker. You got someone, right? Number one is a miracle with no miracle worker. That's clearly absurd. Do you realize that everyone believes in at least one miracle? Christians believe in more than one, but atheists believe in one. They believe that no one created something out of nothing. <laughs> Which takes more faith? In fact, I said to the audience at Texas A&M that night, I said, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality, and by the way, the law of causality doesn't say everything has a cause. The law of causality says everything that comes to be has a cause. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. There has to be an uncaused first cause. Even Aristotle knew this. There has to be an unmove mover. Something whose essence equals his existence. So I said to the audience at Texas A&M that night, I said, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality, that things don't pop into existence out of nothing by nothing without a cause. There is nobody sitting here in this auditorium tonight who is currently worried that as you sit here, a hippopotamus has appeared out of nothing in your dorm room and is currently pooping on your pillow. Right? <laughs> you don't worry about that. You're not worried that a raging Bengal tiger is just going to appear right here in the auditorium and start devouring people, right? Why? Because you know that things don't pop into existence out of nothing by nothing without a cause. And if the whole universe could do so, why doesn't everything do so? Why don't Teslas pop into existence out of nothing by nothing without a cause? You wake up one morning, you look in your driveway, your Hyundai is a Tesla. You go, how do I charge this thing? Why don't MacBook Pros pop into existence out of nothing by nothing without a cause? Could have saved me four grand. If you're hungry after this little seminar tonight and you want to have a pizza, does it make sense to order one? Or should you just sit in your kitchen, wait, and hope? <laughs> one pops into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. No, it's the atheists that have all the faith. In fact, here's a question to ask an atheist. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? I mean, if there is no God, why does anything exist? Now think about this, ladies and gentlemen. If space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing, what could have caused space, time, and matter? to have a beginning. Something outside of space, time, and matter. In other words, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create, because to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice, and only persons can make choices. The being would also have to have a mind to make a choice. Now, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. You say, well, how do you know it's the Christian God, Frank? We don't. Yet. I mean, this could be Allah at this point, or some other theistic God, generic theistic God. We don't get all the way to Christianity by one argument, but if we keep going through the questions, truth, God, miracles, New Testament, and we realize that Jesus rose from the dead, then we can say that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,990 years ago is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. We haven't gotten there yet, but we have six attributes of a cause that looks like it could be the God of the Bible, all right? That's the first argument. Now, the second argument is the argument from design. And by the way, we're going to go through all these points and I know we, got, we have uh, microphones set up for Q&A. We're going to have a little bit of change of plans. We're not going to do Q&A tonight. We're going to do all Q, no A. All right? <laughs> so everyone gets to ask a question, takes all the pressure off me. 
All right, no, no, we'll have time for questions later, so hold your questions. Let's now move on to the teleological argument. There's two aspects to this argument. The first aspect, it appears the universe is designed. The second aspect, it appears that life is designed, your design. Let's just look at the universe first. In recent decades, scientists have discovered that the universe appears to be highly fine-tuned. That if you were to change any one of a number of factors virtually imperceptibly about our universe, the universe would, would never have come into existence or it would have been a universe that couldn't support life or even basic chemistry. And even atheists are admitting this. Again, Stephen Hawking, not a Christian, put it this way. He said if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. If the expansion rate was that infinitesimally different from the very beginning, none of us would be here. Now, you can't make any sort of evolutionary explanation. You can't say, well, maybe it just evolved there by chance, whatever that means. Why? Because this was the starting expansion rate. It didn't evolve to a particular point. It started there. Seems to me the same mind that created space, time, and matter is the same mind that fine-tuned the expansion rate to be precisely what it needed to be for this universe to exist. This is one of the initial conditions of the universe. One of the current conditions of the universe is the force of gravity. If the gravitational force were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40th power compared to the strong nuclear force, we wouldn't exist. What's one part in 10 to the 40th power? That's one part in one with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I, so let me give you an illustration. Cover the entire North American continent from the equator to Greenland in dimes up to the moon. That's like 230-something thousand miles in dimes up to the moon. Then do that on a billion other North American continents. Mix all those dimes together in one huge pile, mark one of them red, mix that red one in, blindfold a friend, throw him in the pile, tell him to randomly pick one dime. The chance that he would pick the one red dime is one chance in 10 to the 40th power. Is he going to pick that dime? No. You know what the chance is that this isn't designed? Zero. Because this value was either designed or it wasn't. What makes the most sense? You say, oh, maybe it was chance. Ladies and gentlemen, what is chance? Does chance cause things? Who caused this? Chance, he was just here. No. <laughs> chance is not a cause. Chance is a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities. Chance doesn't do anything. In fact, you know, when scientists use the word chance, you know what they really mean? Uh, we don't know. This was designed or it wasn't. What, what makes the most sense? Design or not? What do you think? Somebody, and this is just one out of at least a dozen of these. And if you extend it to our solar system, there's even more. In fact, let's take a look at our solar system. It's not just that the universe is designed, our solar system appears to be designed with us in mind. Here we are, third rock from the sun. If we were just a little bit closer to, or a little bit further away, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it is? That's a lie, it's way too hot here in the summer. <laughs> Axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees. Change that slightly, we don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us. Change that slightly, we don't exist. Oxygen in this room right now is 21%. If it were 25%, spontaneous fires would break out. If it were 15%, we'd all suffocate. If Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we couldn't exist here on Earth. Why not? What does Jupiter do for us? Yes, Jupiter's gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. Jupiter is a cosmic vacuum cleaner. In fact, take a close-up look at Jupiter. You see these dark marks here? Those dark marks are comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. Because if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. Same thing is true with Saturn. In fact, take a look at the planets here. There you got in size, you got uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. Look at poor Pluto down here. 
You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. <laughs> and what if Pluto identifies as a planet? <laughs> you bigots. <laughs> Take a look at this. You can hardly see Pluto. Take a look at this. That's Arcturus over here. That's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun. Jupiter is one pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto, forget about it. All right, keep an eye on Arcturus here. Where's Arcturus now? Way over here to the right, see it? To the right of Regal, that's Antares. That's another star in our galaxy. The sun is one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse here, look, I don't name the stars, all right? If the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. The heavens are awesome. And that's just in our galaxy. And the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles, and all that distance is necessary for us to exist in orbit here at Earth. Now, how far is 30 trillion miles? Far. It'll take you at least two tanks of gas and a Toyota Prius <laughs> to go 30 trillion miles. A number of years ago, my wife and I took our three sons to Tucson, Arizona. My in-laws lived out there. And uh, we went to the Desert Museum on the south side of Tucson. If you ever get to go there, it's south of the city over a little mountain ridge there. And on a clear night, it's free of the city light, so you can see thousands of stars in the sky. So we're out there this one night, and the guide says, wow, it's so clear tonight that if we look up at 9.03, we will see the space shuttle in orbit. I said, oh, come on. We're not going to see the space shuttle. I mean, it's only 120 feet long. It's 350 miles up. We're not going to see it. Oh, me of little faith. At 9.03, the guide goes, look! And we look up in the sky, about 70 degrees above the horizon, there's an object streaking across the western desert sky relative to us about like this. I mean, it's really cooking. When it got right about here, it disappeared. I don't know whether Scotty beamed it up or what. <laughs> Actually, what happened was, despite the fact that we were in total darkness, the space shuttle was so high up that the sun was still reflecting off of it, and when it got out of the range of the sun, we couldn't see it anymore. Now, when the space shuttle was in orbit, the space shuttle was traveling at about 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles per second. You got trouble getting to work in the morning? Take the space shuttle. You'll be there. Five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation to try and figure out how long would it take us if we could get in the space shuttle and go from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away in our galaxy, 30 trillion miles. In other words, how long would it take us to go 30 trillion miles if we could go five miles per second? How long? Anyone? A long time. You must be a math major. Yeah. <laughs> it would take us 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star in our galaxy, an average distance away, you've been going five miles a second for 2,000 years, you would be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. <laughs> we're not going anywhere in space. We can hardly get out of our solar system. You know, it took us nine years to get to Pluto. I mean, think about this. Our solar system, if it was the size of a quarter with the sun in the middle and Pluto on the outer rim, you know where the next nearest star is? It's two football fields away. It took us nine years to do this. We're never going to get to another planetary system. It's too far and it's too dangerous. 
You know at the speed of light how long it would take us to get to the next nearest star? Almost four years. Speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. We're never getting there. But let's suppose we figure out space travel one day. In fact, what I'm about to show you now is disturbing, but I'm going to show it to you anyway because you can handle it. Imagine we get to another planetary system, we plant our flag, and then this happens. Ladies and gentlemen, beans are not for astronauts. <laughs> now, to show you how analytical my wife is, I showed her that little video, and she smiled just a little bit, and then she said, that's illogical, there's no sound in space. <laughs> now, how high are the heavens? Notice what the psalmist says. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. How high are the heavens above the earth? I mean, if it's going to take us 200,000 years at five miles a second just to go between two stars in our galaxy, how high are the entire heavens? Well, the Hubble Space Telescope helped us discover that. Way back almost 20 years ago now, they trained the Hubble Space Telescope on 1 26 millionth of the sky for about 11 days of exposure time. What's one twenty-six millionth of the sky? Go outside tonight, put a piece of rice on the end of your finger, hold it up. That piece of rice represents about one twenty-six millionth of the sky. What did they find in this little speck of sky? This is called Hubble Ultra Deep Field. I don't know if you can see this. See along the bottom here? These are mountains, okay? This is the southern hemisphere. And I'm going to show you what they found. They made a little composite video out of this. Uh, what you're going to see when the video comes up is you're going to see the constellations come up and then Hubble's going to zoom out to this 1 26 millionth of the sky. There is no audio, it's just video. This is in the public domain, you can Google this and find this little video. You guys ready? Okay, here we go, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. There are the constellations. Now let's see what they found. What you're looking at are nearly 10,000 galaxies in one twenty-six millionth of the sky, each of these galaxies with billions of stars of their own. Now, if you find... Ten thousand galaxies in one twenty-six millionth of the sky. How many stars are there in the entire universe? The number of stars in the entire universe, according to researchers at the University of Hawaii, is about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth times one hundred thousand. And to go from just one star to another star, going five miles a second will take you over 200,000 years. Now you know why the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I never want to hear anyone ever again at Revival Christian Fellowship to ever use the word awesome unless you're referring to God or the heavens. Awesome shot, dude. Awesome shirt, dude. Awesome TikTok video. No! What are you going to say for God? 
Now, if the heavens are supposed to declare the glory of God, we've got a big problem. Why? Because when we see stars equivalent to sand grades on 100,000 earths, and he is just, meaning he's infinitely just, and this expanse is supposed to give us some sense of that, then none of us are going to make it. Because none of us have been just. All you young people out there, you're all really fine-tuned. You're all really spooled up over justice, which is a good thing. But you don't want justice for yourself. If you got justice from this bean, you wouldn't like it. None of us would. By the way, I just showed you only half of the verse a minute ago. Here's the rest of Psalm 103, verse 11 to 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. This being, whose nature can be at least thought about from our perspective as infinite because the heavens appear to be infinite. This being is infinitely just, but he's also infinitely loving. So how does he remain just and yet somehow remove our transgressions from us? What he does is he adds deity, or he adds humanity to his deity. He comes to earth, he lives the perfect life, and he allows the very creatures who rebelled against him to torture and kill him so he could take our punishment upon himself. That's what Christianity is all about. So if you believe in justice and you believe in love, you ought to believe in Christianity because this is the only being that grounds those two things, and he's the only being that can allow unjust people like you and me to go unpunished. He takes it upon himself. Now, when you think about a universe that has stars equivalent to sand grains on 100,000 Earths, does that make you feel insignificant? It shouldn't. Why? Because the heavens aren't made in the image of God, but you are. The heavens were made so you could exist. Here's the second part of the design argument. The heavens are designed, but so are you, except you're made in the image of God. This is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? In fact, let's go back even further than 11 weeks. Let's go back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? <laughs> I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. <laughs> when your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States. <laughs> 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race. And you won. <laughs> That's right. Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. <laughs> you beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. Now, seeing some of you limp in here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool, but you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.5 billion letter software program we call your genome, your DNA, all the letters in the right order. And then your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book, and it contained the other half of the 3.5 billion letter genome, your software program, your DNA, all the letters in the right order, and when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. Do you know, you have not received any more genetic information from this point till right now. Your genetic information has just duplicated itself. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? 
Think about this. There is only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb when it's genetically the same as a two-year-old toddler? You say, Frank, come on, you can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this, friends. This was the subject of our first book, creatively titled Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law that doesn't legislate morality. The question isn't whether or not you can legislate morality. The question is whose morality will be legislated. And I don't want to legislate my morality. I don't want to legislate your morality. I want to legislate the morality. In fact, when people say, don't impose your morality on me, I say, why not? Would that be immoral? Because you're imposing your morality on me right now. You're saying, oh, I ought not impose ought nots. Well, you're imposing that ought not on me. Why do you get to impose ought nots, but I don't? Actually, the better answer is this. When someone says, don't impose your morality on me, say, this isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder's wrong, that rape is wrong, that abortion's wrong, that theft is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men, and the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society, which is the reason the government's involved in marriage to begin with, is to legally recognize the man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said, is self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles are not of the law, have the law written on their hearts. Everybody knows this basic right and wrong, this basic morality, but some of us don't like it. Look, if you have a problem with the morality, you don't have a problem with me. I didn't make it up. You have a problem with the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. If he doesn't exist, there is no morality. There's no right and wrong. There are no rights. Everything's a matter of opinion. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From this point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. For mosty, anyway. <laughs> Some cells became brain cells, others heart cells, others lung cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million. Knock it off! How is this happening? Are you thinking about this? You're going, wait a minute, Frank, time out. i got to concentrate. New red blood cells coming up. <laughs> no, this is just happening. How is it happening? Well, Aristotle recognized something 2,400 years ago. Of course, he didn't know anything about blood cells, but he did notice that all of nature's going in a direction. For example, why does an acorn, if it's properly nourished, always go in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree or a birch tree or a seahorse? You say, well, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Well, who programmed it? And by the way, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground going, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No. Yet it reliably goes in the direction of becoming an oak tree. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, and it doesn't, yet it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. That is what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God. That if all nature is going in a direction, there must be a mind directing it. That is what he means by God. Now notice, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a big bang cause way back when. That's another argument. This is a cause every single second the universe exists. Aristotle mistakenly thought the universe was eternal. And yet he still said, you need an unmoved mover. You need a being that sets up the laws of nature and keeps everything going the way they're going. So this is a cause every single second the universe exists. This is why the Apostle Paul comes along and says, in Jesus, 
We live and move and have our being. And Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. In fact, God is to the universe what a band is to music. If a band were up here playing music, the band would be creating and sustaining the music, right? What would happen to the music the second the band stopped playing? Music's over. Same thing is true with God. He creates the universe. He creates the natural laws that govern it. He creates you, and he sustains the universe, the natural laws that govern it, and he sustains you. The moment he pulls his hand away, you're gone. Now, there's a lot more in the book stealing from God on this, but we've got to move on to our third argument for God, and that is the moral argument. Let's start by asking you a question. And that is, how do you know that your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing a pick six? That's where he throws the ball to the other team and they take it back for a touchdown themselves. How do you know? This is the interactive portion of the program. How do you know? Huh? Yeah, you gotta know the purpose of the game. Only by knowing the purpose of the game can you know that a touchdown takes you closer to the purpose and a pick six takes you further away. If there is no purpose to the game, you can't say a touchdown's better than a pick six. Now notice, in football, the purpose of the game comes from outside the game. Right now, there's a game going on, 49ers against the Cowboys. Do we have any Cowboys fans in here? Because I'm from New Jersey, and we have a saying in New Jersey, whenever the Cowboys win, it's living proof that Satan is alive and well. (laughs) Anyway, when those teams showed up to play the game, they didn't make the rules up, right? The rules were already set. Everyone knows what the rules were. The field set up, right? The rules came from outside the game. The commissioner and the, pl- and the uh, owners get together, and every once in a while they tweak the rules, right? Now, the rules of football are arbitrary, but the rules of life are not arbitrary. They come from outside the game. They come from God's nature, But the only way you can say that this is a moral way to live and this is an immoral way to live is if you know the purpose of life. Why are we here? By the way, why are we here? What is the purpose of life? You saw the video. (laughs) To get the most stuff? Why are we here? Jesus tells us why we're here. He's praying for us in the garden. In John 17, he's praying to the Father, and he says this, Now this is eternal life, that they, meaning us, he's praying for us, that they may know you, God the Father, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. The purpose of life is to know God, and if you add the Great Commission, to make him known. Not just know that he exists, but to trust in him, follow him, become more like him, because you're going to live forever. That's the purpose of life. And some things will take you closer to knowing him, and other things will take you further away. Look, if there is no God, then you can't say the Nazis were wrong. It's just your opinion. A number of years ago, I debated the president of the American Atheists. His name was David Silverman. And he was was an atheist, but he was Jewish. And so during the debate, I said, look, if there's no God, David, that means the Holocaust wasn't really wrong. And he tried to avoid that conclusion, but I kept pestering him with it. He finally said, you know what, Frank, you're right. The Holocaust wasn't really wrong. And I said, David, if your worldview is telling you that the Holocaust wasn't really wrong, you have the wrong worldview. Dispense with your worldview. Welcome to theism. Because the only way you can objectively say this is right and this is wrong is if God exists, if there's a standard outside of ourselves. If there is no God, love is no better than rape. Oh, you may prefer love better, but it's objectively not better. If there is no God, there are no human rights. You know, in our country, we're creating rights every 10 minutes. You notice that? You know, there's not only no right to same-sex marriage, there's no right to natural marriage if there is no God. 
There's not only no right to abortion, there's no right to life if there is no God. Why? It's just your opinion. How does our founding document start? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were created and endowed by their government. No, it doesn't say that. All men were created and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then Jefferson goes on to say that governments are instituted among men to secure these rights. And if the government fails to secure the rights that the people have, the people have the right to a new government. That was what the Declaration of Independence was all about. But there are no rights. Many of the people arguing for these new rights that were made up in the last 10 minutes are atheists. And notice that instead of debating you on the issue, they try and cancel you. Because if you don't have principle, the only way you can rule is by power. You're either going to rule by principle, what's right and wrong, or you're just going to rule by raw power. If you don't have the principle, what do you do? You just get the power and you shut other people down. That's what cancel culture is. And you know who's responsible for cancel culture? Go home and look in the mirror. You are. I am, because we haven't spoken up enough. We're hiding under our desks while the barbarians are taking over the land. Why is that? You don't care enough about people to want what's best for them? Afraid you're going to get kicked off of TikTok or Facebook or Instagram? Really? We're the problem. We're not being salt and light. We need to be. If there is no God, murder, slavery, and racism are not wrong. Nothing's wrong. Just your opinion. If there is no God, religious people have never done anything wrong. You know, when somebody comes up to you and he says, I can't be a Christian because you guys are all hypocrites. You know what you ought to say? Number one, you're right. We're all hypocrites. And number two, thank you for giving good evidence for the existence of God. Why? Because if there is no God, there's nothing wrong with being a hypocrite. Why would that be wrong? Anytime you're complaining about something that's wrong in society, you're assuming a standard. What is that standard? Just your opinion? Of course we're hypocrites. That's why we need a savior. If there is no God, tolerance is no better than intolerance. By the way, are Christians commanded to be tolerant? Be careful. What do you say? How many say yes? How many say no? Actually, Christians are commanded to be loving. See, tolerance is too weak. Tolerance says hold your nose and put up with them. Love says reach out and help them. And the way that you help people is not to approve of everything they do. You see, in our culture, we think love means approval. Oh, in order to love me, you have to approve of everything I do. Is that really love? How many people in here are parents? All right, how many people in here are former children? All right, good. That's all of us, all right? Question, if your parents approved of everything you wanted to do as a child, were they, would they be loving parents? No. Parents need to stand in the way of evil to protect their kids. Same thing is true with anyone you know. If you want to love somebody, you've got to seek what's best for them, and that means I've got to stand in the way of evil. I'd love you too much to allow you to do this. Don't buy into this nonsense that love means approval. Love means seeking what's best for the other person, and that often means you've got to say no. It was Thomas Sowell, who's now 92 years old, grew up in Harlem and, is, and has uh, taught at some of the, the greatest universities in the world. He put it this way. He said, when you want to help someone, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. And too often we tell people what they want to hear. Why? Because we don't want any blowback when they disagree with us. But that's not love. You know what we're doing? We're sacrificing them for our own comfort. Jesus said, I give you one new command. Love one another as I have loved you. How did he love us? He sacrificed himself for us. How are we supposed to love others? The same way. We have to sacrifice ourselves for the good of others. That means telling them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And if there is no God, you can't complain about the problem of evil. Why can't you complain about the problem of evil? Because if there is no God, there is no good. And if there is no good, there can be no evil. You say, how does that work? 
Because evil doesn't exist on its own. Evil only exists as a lack in a good thing. Evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a good body, you got a better body. What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? You got nothing. Evil is like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of a car, you got a better car. What happens if you take all the car out of the rust? You got a pinto, right? No. <laughs> you got nothing. It doesn't exist. So evil can only exist if good exists, but good can only exist if God exists. And C.S. Lewis realized this. Early on in his life, he was an atheist because he thought, thought there was too much injustice in the world. He said, there can't be a good God. There's too much injustice. And then one day he realized the argument didn't work. It actually showed that God did exist. And here's how he put it in the book, Mere Christianity. As an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, you wouldn't know what unjustice was unless you knew what justice was. You wouldn't know that something was not right unless you knew something was Something can't be immoral unless something is. In fact, you could put it this way. The shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you have to have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil, but you can't have evil without good. You can't have shadows without sunshine. So evil does not disprove God. Evil may prove there's a devil out there, but it can't disprove God. Because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good, and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. So when someone like Christopher Hitchens, you guys know who Christopher Hitchens was? He was a brilliant British atheist who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent. <laughs> well, years ago, I debated him a couple of times. You can see this on our YouTube channel. He wrote the book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. Now, this word poisons just is a nice, a fun way of saying religion's evil. So I asked him during the debate, what do you mean by evil, Christopher? Evil does not exist unless good exists, and good only exists if God exists. He wouldn't answer the question. In fact, at one point in the debate, I said, Christopher, a lot of what you say in your book about how much evil religious people have done is true. But you're sort of proving our worldview. Because if we were perfect, we wouldn't need a savior. In fact, I said in the second debate, I said, Christopher, I can't live up to what Jesus told me to live up to. I'm a hypocrite. But if I could live up to what he, he told me to live up to, I wouldn't need him. I wouldn't need a savior if I was perfect. You know, so I'm fallen. I'm a hypocrite. And so when people say, I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, come on down, pal. We got room for one more. <laughs> We're all hypocrites. Now, I know theologically we're saints in the eyes of God, but we're still, we're still fallen. And by the way, religion doesn't poison everything. Everything poisons religion. I poison religion because I don't live up to the standard that God gave us. Now, there's a lot more in the books on this argument, but let's just sum up where we've been. From the cosmological argument, we've discovered that the cause is spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, and personal, and also has a mind. From the design argument, we get more information that this being has a mind, and we can also see that he's sustaining the universe every single second of, his ex of its existence. From the moral argument, we can see that this being is moral. So all of this together shows us we have a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent creator who created and sustains all things and is a moral being. This sounds an awful lot like the God of the Bible, and we haven't even opened the Bible yet. This is called natural theology. You can discover all this without any reference to any religious book. Now, you're probably thinking, well, Frank, atheists have good responses to this, don't they? No. I'm just telling you, they don't. In fact, atheism makes reason itself impossible. I can't say anything better than C.S. Lewis, so I'm just going to read you this quote. You know, most atheists today are materialists. They think you're just a molecular machine because there's no immaterial reality. You're just a moist robot. Everything you think is the result of natural causes. 
Everything you think is the result of the laws of physics. You're not really reasoning, you're just reacting. You don't have free will. You're a robot. Here's what Lewis said about this. Check this out. It's a two-slide quote. Stay with him on it. Here we go. Suppose there were no intelligence behind the universe. In that case, nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking. Thought is merely the byproduct of some atoms within my skull. But if so, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? But if I can't trust my own thinking, of course I can't trust the arguments leading to atheism and therefore have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. Unless I believe in God, I can't believe in thought, so I can never use thought to disbelieve in God. <laughs> Boom! As John Madden would say. You can't say it any better than that. The very, your very ability to reason presupposes a mind. And by the way, when someone asks you, how do you know that God exists? What you ought to say is, I know God by his effects. I'm reasoning from effect back to cause. This is what scientists do. They find an effect, they're trying to figure out what the cause is. If there's a creation, that's the effect. The cause must be a creator. If there's design, that's the effect. We're reasoning back to a cause, a designer. If there's a moral law written on our hearts, that's the effect. We're reasoning back to a moral law giver. If you have the ability to think, that's the effect. You're reasoning back to a cause of mind. If there's evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, that's the effect. We're reasoning back to a cause that could rise a man from the dead, God. So we're reasoning from effect back to cause. Every effect has a cause. And if you don't believe every effect has a cause, you know what you've just done? You've just defeated and thrown out science because science is built on cause and effect. That's what you're doing when you're doing science. You're trying to discover what particular cause caused this particular effect. So atheists claim to be champions of science. Ironically, atheism makes science impossible. So how are we going to discover who the true God is then? We've got to go to the third question, are miracles possible? Now you're probably wondering, how are we going to get through this, Frank? We've got to get to questions. Actually, number three is the fastest one. It's easy. It's really easy to show that miracles are possible. The problem is a lot of people don't think miracles are possible. They think they're impossible. For example, Noah. All right, Christians, is this being recorded, by the way? Is this being streamed right now? Let's try and keep this just between ourselves, can we? Christians, can we all agree that Noah and the ark is crazy? Please. Also, a resurrection. How many people in here have ever seen anyone rise from the dead after you knew the person was dead for at least 36 hours? Yeah, none of us. Yet if you're a Christian, you have to believe what none of us have ever seen. How rational is that? And for some reason, the big problem miracle in the Bible is Jonah. Is that a whale of a tail or a tail of a whale? I mean, what is the deal with Jonah? Can you actually believe in Jonah? I mean, please. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? No, the resurrection's easy compared to the greatest miracle in the Bible. The greatest miracle in the Bible is... I got some of you a second time. Yes. The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible, right? I mean, if it's true that God can create the universe out of nothing, can he do whatever he wants that's not logically impossible inside the universe? Of course, if he can create the whole show, can he walk on water? Can he part the Red Sea? Can he do the Jonah miracle, the Noah miracle? Of course Noah's crazy. Unless God exists. Of course Jonah makes no sense. Unless God exists. Now here's the real interesting thing. The atheists are admitting the evidence for the first verse. Now they don't think it's God, but what else could it be? If Genesis 1-1 is true, all these other miracles are at least possible. You can't rule them out. Now, I just said something some of you might not agree with. I said, God can do whatever he wants. It's not logically impossible. You're probably thinking, oh, God can do anything. No, there's many things God can't do. He can't do logically impossible things. Like he can't create a married bachelor. 
I know some guys try, but no, okay? Doesn't exist. Can't create a one-ended stick. Doesn't exist. Can't create a five-sided triangle. Doesn't exist. Can't create a square circle. Doesn't exist. Can't create an honest politician. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there are some things that are too hard for God. I mean, you can do some things that God can't do. What can you do that he can't do? Sin, right? If he could sin, he wouldn't be the standard of perfection. Lie. He can't lie. He wouldn't be the standard of truth. He can't go out of existence. So there's several things that you can do that God can't do because he, by his nature, is the standard. Now, I know a lot of people don't believe in miracles because they've never seen one. That's not a good reason to disbelieve something. Why? Because you believe in a lot of things you've never seen. You believe in your mind. Have you ever seen it? You're using it right now, I hope. You believe in the laws of logic, the laws of mathematics. Have you ever seen them? No, you use them all the time. You believe in justice. Have you ever seen justice? Oh, you may have seen people treated justly or unjustly, but you've never seen justice. Why? Because it's an immaterial reality, virtue grounded in the nature of God. You've never seen love. And everyone here believes in love. Oh, you may have been loved, you may have loved, but you, you've never seen love. Why? Because it's not a physical thing. In fact, in the second debate with Hitchens, one kid in the audience asked Hitchens this question, Christopher, what is love? And Hitchens, being a materialist, had to come up with some sort of material answer. So he said, love is a chemical. And I said, don't tell that to your wife. Honey, do you love me? Yeah. Why? Because I got the chemical today. <laughs> Tomorrow I might not have it. No, love is not a chemical. It's a virtue grounded in the nature of God. You've never seen gravity. Oh, Frank, come on. It's right there. No, nope. you're not seeing gravity. What are you seeing? You're seeing the effects of gravity. You know, we really don't even know what gravity is. If ask, ask any scientist what's gravity. Ask any scientist what energy is. I don't know. We don't know what it is. We can see its effects. You've never seen George Washington. Yet you believe he exists. Why? Because he's left effects behind that are best explained by a man who lived from 1732 to 1799. His name is George Washington. And you've never seen Jesus either. But you have good evidence to believe he, he actually existed and exists today because he's left effects behind. And sometimes he interve even intervenes now. So just because you haven't seen something doesn't mean you ought not believe it. Other people have said, well, you can't believe in miracles because... Uh, you can't violate natural laws. We're not talking about violating natural laws. We're talking about overpowering natural laws. I'm overpowering a natural law right now. What law am I overpowering? Gravity. Now, if I can overpower a natural law, can the God who created and sustains natural laws overpower them? Of course. Now, it's true. If I decide I don't want to overpower it anymore, okay, natural law takes over. But if I can overpower it, so can God. So don't buy into the idea that miracles are not possible. Now, I do need to say this about miracles. Miracles are not required since the close of the canon, since the first century for Christianity to be true. There could be no miracles between the close of the first century and today, and Christianity would still be true. Now, I do think there have been miracles and are miracles today. In fact, Craig Keener, a brilliant scholar from Asbury Seminary, did a research project where he actually wrote a hernia-inducing two-volume set that's like over 1,100 pages called Miracles about modern-day miracles. But even if he's wrong about that, if God exists, if Genesis 1-1 is true, then miracles are at least possible. You can't rule them out. And miracles are used to let us know who speaks for God. Why should you follow Moses and not Muhammad? Because Moses can do miracles. Why should you follow Jesus and not Joseph Smith? Because Jesus can do miracles. That authenticates that the person speaks for God. 
In fact, this God who created and sustains the universe, who didn't have a beginning and won't have an end, we have a name for this being. What is the name? The great I am. Do you remember when Jesus was going up against the Pharisees? And he says, before Abraham was born, I am. And they picked up stones to stone him. Why were they picking up stones to stone him? Who was he quoting? He's quoting from the Old Testament. Exodus 3.14, the burning bush. Do you remember when God appeared to Charlton Heston? <laughs> and Moses says to God, who should I tell the Israelites you are? And God says, tell them I am sends you. What does I am mean? I am means the self-existent eternal one. The being that had no beginning, the being that had no end, the being that just bees. The being that grounds all other being. This is the God of the Bible. So, we know that miracles are possible because God exists. Now we just need to see if the one miracle in the New Testament, the resurrection actually occurred. Because if it did, then Christianity is true. Now, in I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist in the book Stealing from God, we have at least 10 different reasons, 10 lines of evidence to show the New Testament writers are telling the truth. We don't have time for that. I'm only going to show you two of them and very briefly. The first one I want to talk about that lets us know that the New Testament writers are telling the truth is something called embarrassing stories. What are embarrassing stories? Historians know that if they find something in the text that's embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why? Because you're not going to invent things that make you look bad. You might invent things that make you look good, right? But you're not going to invent things that make you look bad. In fact, let me ask you guys a question in here. How many people have ever lied to make yourself look good? Look, if you don't have your hand up right now, you're lying <laughs> to make yourself look good. And it's not working. We know you're lying. All right, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look bad? You don't lie to make yourself look bad. You might lie to make yourself look good. Well, the New Testament writers have filled the New Testament. This is true of the Old Testament as well, but we're just looking at the New Testament. The New Testament writers have filled the New Testament with embarrassing stories that make them look bad. They never would have invented this. That's why we call this the duh factor. They're not making this up. Let me just give you a few of these. Notice Peter, their leader, the disciples' leader, is called Satan by Jesus. You think they invented this? You think Mark at one point said to Peter, hey, Pete, I'm going to make this a real interesting story. I'm going to have the Lord call you Satan. What do you think Peter would have said? Have him call you Satan. <laughs> look, I'm the leader here. This doesn't look good. And then Peter says, oh, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He denies him three times. And then at the crucifixion, all the disciples, maybe with the exception of one, they all run away. They're cowards. This is like a Monty Python movie. Run away. They all run away. And who are the brave ones? The women. The women are the brave ones. That's right, ladies. You can give yourselves a hand. That's right. I am woman. Hear me roar. Didn't run away like you sissy pants men did. <laughs> now, who wrote the New Testament down? Men. Now, what man is going to invent that he was hiding for fear of the Jews why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb? Would any man in here invent that? I mean, if I was there and inventing it, I'd make myself look good, wouldn't you? I mean, I'd write down there something like this. Let's see, we marched right down there and we overpowered that elite Roman guard. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Yep. John said, get out. <laughs> Peter roundhouse kicked him. <laughs> Thomas said, we'll be back. <laughs> no doubt. And then on Sunday morning, we marched right down to the tomb and we saw Jesus who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we went and comforted the trembling women. <laughs> I would never say it was Mr. Sissy Pants why the women went down to discover the empty tomb. And oh, by the way, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses in that culture? 
Forget about the fact that it was embarrassing to men. It was. But independent of that, why would you never have the women be the first witnesses in that culture? Because a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you're making up the New Testament story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four gospels say the women were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? They really were. In fact, one of them was a formerly demon-possessed woman. Gee, what a great, credible witness you have there. <laughs> you think they're making this up? I had a lady come up to me once. She said, Frank, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. <laughs> I said, that is an excellent point. I had not thought of that. Because ladies, when your man comes home from work, does he say much? <laughs> there could have been a nuclear explosion down at the plant. He's not going to tell you. You'll see it on the news before you hear it from him. You'll be watching the news going, hey, hon, what happened? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> the nuke blew up. I've been hot for three days. <laughs> What's for dinner? He's not going to tell you. I can't even believe this next verse is in the New Testament, but it is. You know the Great Commission, right? This is the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus takes his disciples up on the hill there in Galilee. He's got them all there. He's given them his final instructions, where he says, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Notice he doesn't say make believers. It's a difference. Make disciples of all nations, right? And as he's giving them, the Great Commission, it says right there in verse 17 about the disciples there, it says, some believed, but some doubted. What? He's standing resurrected right in front of them. And they're standing there going, you see that guy over there? Yeah. That guy over there is Jesus. Oh, I'm telling you, it can't be Jesus. He was killed not long ago. No, I'm telling you, it's him. Look, Jesus is dead. The Romans killed him. It's him. They... They know how to kill people. They whipped them. They put, they put nails in them. They put a spear in his side. Blood and water came out. If they didn't kill him, they would be killed by the Roman authorities. I'm telling you, Jesus is dead. It, 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 it's him. It can't be. It is. How do you know? The women told me. <laughs> They're not making this up. There's even potentially embarrassing details about Jesus in there. In Mark chapter 3, it says his own family came to seize him and take him home because they thought he was out of his mind. Jesus' own family thought he was nuts. That's embarrassing. And you know, you may have heard the scholars say the New Testament writers invented Jesus to be God. Oh, really? Then why is Mark 3 in there? which is almost universally recognized to be the earliest gospel. Jesus is called a madman. He's called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. His own brothers don't believe in him. Jesus has his, has his uh, feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which easily could have been seen as a sexual advance. And oh, by the way, notice there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline. Who are they? Rahab and... Tamar. Tamar plays the prostitute, right? Now, do you think Matthew and Luke, when they decided to write down the genealogy, said, you know what? I really think we ought to spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. What do you say? Put a couple of prostitutes in there? It's a Messiah. And there's, in fact, there's a lot of shady people in the bloodline. Judah, from where we get the term Jew from? Jesus, from the tribe of Judah. Not a good guy. Judah's the one that sold Joseph into slavery. Not a good guy. David. David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. Gee, I guess there's hope for the rest of us then, huh? <laughs> Bathsheba's in there. In fact, when Matthew gets to her in the genealogy, he won't mention her name. What does he say otherwise? Yes. He says, Uriah's wife. He's telling the truth, but it's a slam. Notice this. Who is Uriah? 
husband of Bathsheba, whom David had killed so he could have Bathsheba. This is not an invented story, ladies and gentlemen. It's embarrassing. And then they hang Jesus on a tree. If you want to make a Messiah to the Jews, you don't hang him on a tree. Why? Because according to Deuteronomy 21-23, anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. Well, Jesus was under God's curse. What curse? The curse of sin we put him under. But if you were making this up, you wouldn't say that. In fact, notice in Genesis, there are two trees. What are the two trees? Tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then go all the way to the end of the Bible. Go to Revelation. What tree is in Revelation? The tree of life. There's actually a third tree right in the middle. That's the tree they hung Jesus on. Because we sinned at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the only way we could have access again to the tree of life is if Jesus takes our punishment on himself by being hung on a tree. But if you're making this up, you would never say that. There's a lot more embarrassing details in the New Testament and even the Old Testament that shows you they're not inventing this. In fact, Dennis Prager, you may know who he is. He's a conservative Jewish man who has written some commentaries on the Old Testament. He says one of the reasons, he says the number one reason I know that the Old Testament's true is because the Jews would never say these embarrassing things about themselves. They would never invent these things. Most histories are whitewashed, if you, if you haven't noticed. The Pharaoh only reports when he wins. He doesn't report when things go wrong. The Jews, on the other hand, and the Christians, they reveal all the warts and all the sins and all of the evil that the supposed heroes of the story do. They're not making it up. Here's one other reason we know the New Testament writers are telling the truth. Excruciating deaths. Now, these people were in a position to know whether Jesus had resurrected from the dead or not. And yet they went to their deaths saying that he was resurrected when they could have saved themselves by saying he wasn't. Now, it's really important to keep in mind that all the writers of the New Testament, with the exception of Luke, were all Jewish believers in Yahweh. Luke's the only Gentile. Everybody else is a baptized Jew who thought they were part of God's chosen people. And there are two things they didn't believe in the first century. They didn't believe a man could claim to be God. That would be blasphemy. And they didn't think that someone would rise from the dead in the middle of time. They knew we'd all rise from the dead at the end of time, according to Daniel 12, but they would never say that one guy rose from the dead in the middle of time. Yet these Jews who thought they were God's chosen people, came to believe that a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead. What could have caused them to do that? In fact, let's take a look at the apostles' beliefs and practices before and after the resurrection. Before the resurrection, they believed in animal sacrifice. They've been slaying lambs for hundreds of years. And then suddenly Jesus comes along and they say, we don't need to slay these lambs anymore because these lambs are just symbols of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here he is. They do away with the sacrificial system virtually overnight. Before they believed in the binding law of Moses. Afterwards, Christ's life has fulfilled the binding law of Moses. Before they believed in strict monotheism. Afterwards, they're believing in a trinity. Three persons in one divine essence. Yes, I know the trinity is hinted at in the Old Testament but it's much clearer in the new. Before they believed in the Sabbath, in fact, they thought they, they, they could be stoned for not obeying the Sabbath. Afterwards, they're worshiping on Sunday. And Paul says, don't let anyone tell you you'll have to obey any Sabbath or festival day. Why? Because the Sabbath has arrived. You see, the Sabbath signified rest. Who's our rest? Jesus is our rest. In fact, out of the Ten Commandments, nine of them are repeated in the New Testament as binding on Christians. What's the only one that isn't? Keep holy the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath has arrived. Before they believed in a conquering Messiah, afterwards a sacrificial Messiah. Before they believed in circumcision, afterwards they believed in baptism and communion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what would have caused these pious Jews 
who thought they were God's chosen people to abandon everything on the left and adopt everything on the right virtually overnight. The only thing I can think of is what psychologists call an impact event. What's an impact event? An impact event is an event that is so dramatic in your life that it can turn your perspective around 180 degrees. You might not remember what you had for breakfast this morning, but you'll remember an impact event that happened 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago if you're old enough. In fact, there's probably only a few of you in this room right now that can answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you can remember where you were and what you were doing November 22nd, 1963, hold your hand up high for everyone to see. Ladies and gentlemen, you see these people with their hands up? These people are very old. (laughs) November 22nd, 1963 is my earliest memory. I was two years old in two days. Yes, yes, I'm 61 years old now. I know, I know. I don't look a day over 60. Actually, actually, when I turned 50, my wife was very encouraging. She said, honey, you're going to live to be 100. I said, how do you know? She said, because you look half dead already. <laughs> anyway, November 22nd, 1963, I'm a toddler. I'm two years old in two days. I'm standing in the living room in our home in Wanamassa, New Jersey, and my mother is sitting on an ottoman in front of a black and white TV, weeping uncontrollably. Mommy, what's the matter? What's the matter? They killed the president. They killed the president. President Kennedy assassinated that day. I can still see my mother in my mind right now when she was 26 years old sitting on that ottoman. I was just with her last week in Florida. She's 85 now. But I can see her in my mind when she was 26 years old. It was an impact event. I don't remember anything before that and very little after that. (laughs) Never seen my mom cry like that. Where were you when the second plane hit the tower? I was in my home office in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I live, and I had the TV on behind me. And I had seen the first tower had been hit, but I didn't know by what. And I was on the phone with a pastor on the north side of of Charlotte, and we were talking about what topic I would talk about when I came to his church. And I said, you got the TV on? He goes, yeah. I go, maybe a Cessna hit the World Trade Tower. That had happened before, so. We're talking, TV's behind me, and suddenly he screams into the phone. He goes, the second tower just got hit. I turned around, look at the TV. The second tower's on fire. I said, was it a Cessna? He goes, no, 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 it was like a a passenger plane. It was like a, a United plane. I said, you saw that? He goes, it was just on live TV. I said, look, 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 let me call you back. I hung up the phone. And for some reason that morning I had CNN on. (laughs) The Communist News Network. (laughs) And I'm not making this up, but the commentator on CNN said, one has to think there's some sort of navigational error here. (laughs) I said, navigational error? This is the clearest day in the history of the Big Apple. You don't think pilots can see where they're going? You think Stevie Wonder's flying these planes? I mean, come on, this is terrorism. I called the pastor the next day. I said, we're going to come to your church and talk about Islam because that's what this is related to. Now, 9-11 was over 21 years ago. And those of you who are old enough in here can remember something about that day. But if I were to ask you where you were 21 days ago, most of you are going to go, I don't know, let me me look at my iPhone. What was I doing that day? (laughs) Why can you remember something from 21 years ago, but not 21 days ago? No impact event 21 days ago. Impact event 21 years ago. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, do you think that would have been an impact event? Do you think that would have enabled them to remember everything he said and did after they saw that, they'd never forget that, would they? And it's the only way I can figure out why they would have abandoned everything on the left and adopted everything on the right. I mean, they they believed this stuff for hundreds of years, and then suddenly, boom, no, we don't believe it anymore. Why? Because a man claimed to be God and then rose from the dead. 
Why would they make this up? In fact, think about it this way. What did the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion? What did they get? They got kicked out of the synagogue, and then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, that was not a list of perks. We're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah. What's it going to get us? First, we get kicked out of the synagogue, then we'll get beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up. (laughs) What a great idea. Why haven't we thought of this earlier? No, I don't think so. In fact, they had every motive to say the resurrection didn't happen, not every motive to say it did. Now, I get this question. Maybe you get this question, too, if you're a Christian. Are there any non-Christian writers that talk about Jesus and the apostles? Yeah, there are. They're in chapter 9 of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. People like Josephus, Suetonius, Dallas, Phlegon, these household names you've probably heard about. None of these people are eyewitnesses, but they basically say the same storyline as the New Testament. But you know why people ask that question often? Are there any non-Christian writers? Because they're thinking, you know, you really can't trust the New Testament writers because, you see, the New Testament writers were biased. You see, they were Christians. You you just have to look at the non-Christian writers or the secular writers to figure out what really happened. If you think about that for more than 10 seconds, you realize how stupid that is. What did these people have to gain by saying it was true? Nothing. They had everything to lose. In fact, my friend Jay Warner Wallace, you may know about, he's a cold case homicide detective who's been on Dateline more than any other homicide detective because he solves murders that are decades old. In fact, his son may have been on that Torrance case this morning because that's where uh, this guy apparently who did the shooting last night was found today. Uh, Jim's father and Jim's son were all cops in the Torrance PD and his son is still a cop there. Anyway, Jim has taken his homicide detective skills and applied them to the greatest homicide of all time, the homicide of Jesus. He wrote a book called Cold Case Christianity. And he says that whenever he finds a body that he knows has been murdered, he says, I know there's only three reasons why that guy's dead. I don't have to look for a thousand motivations for why this guy's been murdered. There's only three reasons. One of these three or a combination of the three. That guy's dead because there was a sex issue, a money issue, or a power issue. Sex, money, or power. Those are the three motivators that can cause people or motivate people to murder. In fact, those are the same three motivators that cause any of us to sin. Why? Because sex, money, and power are good things. The problem is they're so good, we'll often take shortcuts to get them. So what Jim says is if you're going to say that the New Testament writers invented all this, you got to find one or more of those three motivators. So let's go through it. Ladies and gentlemen, did the writers of the New Testament get real popular with the ladies for saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? No, they didn't get sex. Did they get money? No, they weren't 21st century prosperity gospel preachers. Did they get power? No, they got the opposite of power. Paul had power when he was Saul persecuting the church. As soon as he becomes Paul and is a Christian, he's the one persecuted. He's lost all his power. They didn't get sex. They didn't get money. They didn't get power. There's no motivation to make this up. And then you might ask the question, why would they die for a known lie? At this point, you're going to say, wait a minute, Frank, time out. If you're going to say that, if you're going to say that martyrdom somehow is evidence for Christianity, don't you have to say martyrdom is evidence for Islam? No. Why? Because there's a lot of differences between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times, but let's just look at one difference for our purposes here. The Muslim martyrs of today don't have evidence. They haven't witnessed anything that tells them that Islam is true. They just have faith. The New Testament martyrs, on the other hand, witnessed Jesus rise from the dead. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. Some people will die for a lie they think is the truth. Nobody will die for a lie they know is a lie. And the New Testament writers were in a position to know whether it was a lie or not, and they went to their deaths anyway. You can't get better evidence than that unless you were there yourself. 
Now, what I'm about to say, the last thing I'm going to say on this, and this is going to sound like heresy, Pastor John, for just a second, but it's not. Stick with me. Christianity is not true because a series of documents we put under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. How can that be? Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Why? Because they didn't read about it in a book. They saw Jesus, they touched Jesus, they ate with Jesus, they verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. Later, they put it in a book. But it wasn't the book that gave us Christianity, it was the resurrection that gave us Christianity. Do you see the point? Thankfully, they later put it into a book so we could know about it and orient our lives toward it but you wouldn't have documents written in the first century by Jews claiming a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead unless a man claimed to be God and actually rose from the dead. In fact, we could put it this way. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. You wouldn't have documents written in the first century by Jews saying this had happened unless it really did. There's no motive to make this up. Every motive to say it didn't happen because they paid with their lives with it. Now, let's go through the overall outline real quickly. Does truth exist? If someone says there's no truth, you're going to say, is that true? Does God exist? First argument. Cosmological, one person listened. Second argument, teleological. Third argument, moral. Are miracles possible? What's the greatest miracle in the Bible? Genesis 1.1. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Sure seems we only looked at two out of ten reasons. Embarrassing and excruciating testimony. So, with that being said... Don't forget to text the word evidence to 855-909-0582, 855-909-0582. If you do that, I'm going to send you the entire PowerPoint presentation, 360 slides, PDF. If you want to get books, we're out of books, but you can order it now. We'll send it here to be here next week. Now, there's that number again. Also, uh, I want to point out we're teaching online courses now. I'm teaching online courses. Uh, Stephen C. Meyer is from the Discovery Institute. We've got Gary Habermas teaching courses. He's the world-renowned expert on the resurrection. Sean McDowell, uh, Jay Warner Wallace, the guy you just saw. So check all that out. We even have a new course for 6th to 8th graders starting February 6th. You may want to check that out if you have a young person. We're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. In fact, we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've actually combined these three into one social media platform. We call it You Twit Face. <laughs> it's kind of a Jersey thing. Have you signed up for You Twit Face yet? <laughs> yeah, we're on Instagram and TikTok too, all right? But don't forget about the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast, wherever you get podcasts. We're on TV Wednesday nights here. It would be 6 p.m. Eastern time. And if you don't do anything else, download the free cross-examined app. Because on the app, we've got the podcast, we've got the TV show, we've got the blog, just about everything on the website. We also have a quick answer section. So you might be having lunch with somebody, and they say something that's wrong, and you don't know how to handle it. All you need to do is take your iPhone or your Droid out and go, hey, hang on, I'm getting a text. Hey, what about this? Got an answer right there. Why not? All right, so it's true. So what? Well, the best news of all, someone actually did die for you. Now, when I was in the Navy, I was in naval aviation, we had to earn golden wings, which were fairly hard to earn. But there's nothing more difficult in the Navy maybe any military to earn than a golden trident. Very few people that start SEAL training make it through. Five, maybe 
Those that do make it through wear that trident with pride. It is their identity. When Michael Monsor was buried in Rosecrans Cemetery right down here in San Diego, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up for his funeral. And when they passed his casket, they took off their tridents and they pressed them into his casket. They took their identity and put their identity in the one that sacrificed himself for them. That's what we're supposed to do. But our culture says, no, don't put your identity in your savior. Put your identity in your political party or put your identity in your ethnic group or put your identity in your sexual orientation or your vocation or your bank account. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that none of those things are ultimate? You can lose everything in this world. You can lose your spouse, you can lose your children, you can lose your fortune, you can use, lose your job. You can lose your status. You're eventually going to lose your life. The only thing you can't lose is your Savior. He's eternal. Why would you put your identity in anything other than Him? He went to the cross. So his biographer, John, who wrote the Gospel of John, says in the first chapter, he has given you the right to become a child of God. Do you realize that every other religion and every other worldview out there tells you that you have to achieve your identity? Man, if you have to achieve your identity, all the pressure's on you. You've got to perform. And there's always somebody that can do it better. If you put your identity in your job, what happens to you when you're, you lose your job? You no longer have an identity? If you put your job in another person, what happens when, God forbid, that person leaves you or dies? You no longer have an identity? If you put your identity in your bank account, what happens when the stock market crashes? You no longer have anything. You no longer have an identity? No, you and I were meant to put our identity in our, in our Savior. We don't achieve our identity. We receive our identity. You don't do anything. You just accept it. It's yours forever. It's a gift. It takes all the pressure off you and you can't lose it. And he didn't just die. He also rose again. 